Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Batavia Public Library uh, for Brooks with Dean Bites. And the uh, first thing I want to do is to remind everyone to put their cell phones on silent. Uh, as, a, as a courtesy to our speaker. And the second thing I want to do is to remind everyone that if you'd like to receive uh, email notifications of upcoming Books for Advice programs, and you're not getting those now, we have a sign-up uh, clipboard over here that has a, a sign-up sheet on it. So if you give us your name and your email address, we'll be happy to add you to that list. And it's the type of list, if you get tired of getting the emails, you can always take your name off of it. But, uh, but if you would like to get advance notice of all these programs, please keep that in mind. And uh, as uh, many of you may know, uh, Betty Moorhead has passed away at the age of 99. Uh, she and her, and her husband, uh, Lee Moorhead, who was, and Lee was a, a former trustee of the library, uh, began this program, and uh, Lee was uh, very proud to, uh, as he moved around as pastor, to begin a, this kind of a program in the places that he uh, served. And uh, what year are we in? 31? Is it 30? 31. Yeah, 31. Yeah, 30. So 31 years in Batavia, and it's been at the library since the new building opened. Which can you believe it was 18 years ago that, the new, that this building opened? So anyway, um, so uh, anyway, back to the 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 main uh, my main purpose is that. Uh, uh, we, of course, will miss Betty, and uh, uh, the library has a, like to present some flowers to uh, Becky Hogan in memory of her mother. And uh, Stacy, could you, uh, are we going to present them or just leave them sitting there? Becky? Yeah. Yeah, there's Becky there. So uh, we miss your mom. She was a, a wonderful, dear woman. Um, well, I didn't say so. I'm George Sheets. I'm the director of the library. Um, and I've been here 15 years, and I can hardly believe that. Uh, but it's been a wonderful 15 years and the best town I've ever lived in. And I want to introduce today Ellen Huxtable, who is the owner of Advantage Business Concepts, uh, which offers solutions to grow strong businesses. And uh, uh, I've known Ellen for uh, some time now. Uh, She's a graduate of the uh, Kellogg Graduate School of Management, Northwestern University. Uh, she uh, has spoken at national and regional management events and has written for multiple publications. Uh, she is uh, known here as a dynamic facilitator and conducts workshop, workshops and seminars. She uh, uh, has a program on BATV. I hope you saw the program on BATV. <laughs> that is a wonderful uh, snapshot of what's going on uh, around here in this area. And as a past presenter at Pachacacha, Batavia, and I'm, I'm not going to take the time to explain what Pachacacha is for those that don't know it, but it's a wonderful format, and she did a wonderful presentation. She's also an adjunct professor at uh, instructor at Wabansi Community College, a member of the Fermi uh, National Accelerator Laboratory Community Board, and the founder of a uh, small business networking group that is uh, headquartered at the Congregational Church across the street. And uh, Ellen is one of a kind. She's a knowledgeable person who shares her experience with others and does so with passion, persistence, and outstanding professionalism. And I want you to give a warm Batavia welcome to Ellen Huston. George, and thank you for all for being here, and thank you for the people that started Books Between Bites, because this is a tremendous thing that we have for our community. And today, what I'd like to share with you is a book that was written by George Takei. Now, most of us know George Takei as Mr. Sulu from Star Trek, and he actually did pretty well as a Star Trek person. He worked his way up from lieutenant up the ranks. But this book is of a special interest to me because George Takei's book covers his youth. 
and it covers his life to the present time. But it concentrates on the time that he and his family spent during World War II incarcerated in a camp that was the place that they evacuated Japanese Americans from the West Coast. And so that was the core of his book. And it's also something that resonates with me because just like George Takei and his parents, my parents and my grandparents and aunts and uncles and some of my older cousins also were evacuated from the West Coast to inland camps. And so I'm doing research on that. I am in the process of writing an historical novel on my parents' experiences. But George Takei's experiences also fed into that same body of knowledge. So, why this book? Again, I have great personal interest in the subject. The left-hand side is a copy of George Takei's book's cover. It is a graphic novel, which for some of us is a brand new format. It has pictures, we think of it like a comic book, but it's not quite the same as what we consider as Batman, Superman, Little Rich, Little Dot, Donald Duck, all those guys. This is a, a book that has content in a format that is more accessible and more visual. The other pictures that you're going to see today are several in nature. The pictures that are color pictures are pictures that I took when my family and I visited Manzanar in November of last year. Now Manzanar is another relocation center camp just like the one that George Takei and his family were evacuated to. Manzanar is currently a national historic site. And as a national historic site, what they have done is they have reconstructed certain buildings so people can get a visual and tactile feel for what the buildings and the environment was like. So the pictures, there are pictures of reconstructions, although the one at the very top there is not a reconstruction. That one is an actual portion of one of the barracks that was taken from one of the camps, I don't know which one, but placed in the Japanese American National Museum, which is in Los Angeles, California. So, George Takei. George Takei is everybody's you know, Lieutenant Sulu, right? He was a, had a tremendous acting career, not only on Star Trek, but on things like Twilight Zone. He was an actor that was very resonant with large numbers of people in the audience. But in addition to being an actor, he used and is using his visibility in a number of different ways. For example, he is a writer. He wrote the book, obviously. He is a social media persona. Very, very highly followed on social media. Very, very popular. And he's also a, a, an activist for social causes. And as we go through the book, we'll find out a little bit more about how we got involved in that. So the book is a graphic novel. It is fun, it is accessible, it is available at the public library, except I just checked it out, so I'll put it back so somebody else can check it out. But it's very accessible. It's a very, very fun book. It is, it focuses on his whole life, but it focuses predominantly on his life between the ages of about four and about eight, because that was when he and his family were interned in a camp for the duration of World War II. And the interesting thing about the book is because it was his experiences as a child, what you get is you get the innocence and the naivete of a child. And you get his impressions of what was happening when he was a child. And then because it's, it's written as a flashback, you also get his insights since that time and his adult understanding of what was happening. So the book is very interesting in that respect. So the book starts out with, well, with the typical, I was born in, right? So he was born in Los Angeles. He therefore was second generation, maybe third. His mother was already second generation. His father was first generation. But he was a US citizen by birth, lived in Los Angeles. His father and mother were, they had a dry cleaning business. So they were very well off. They had a house, they had possessions, they had a very thriving business. And George was born in April of 1937. He also had a younger brother 
and a younger sister at the time of World War II. So, on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor was bombed. And with that, the United States entered World War II. The day Pearl Harbor was bombed, the government agencies knew the people that were Japanese American that were in positions of leadership. So on the day Pearl Harbor was bombed, they knew who they were gonna go pick up. So some people that were Japanese Americans who might have been pastors, or they were newspaper people, or they were people that maybe taught Japanese language classes, were all picked up at work and taken into custody immediately. The anti-Japanese and anti-Asian sentiments were always present. One of the things that, fit, that fits to this whole story is that Asian Americans that were not born in this country, but the first generation Asian immigrants were prohibited from becoming naturalized citizens until 1952, which meant that we had people that had been in this country from the time perhaps they were children, and they came across as immigrants to this country and were precluded from becoming naturalized citizens. The way that that happened is a little bit strange because at first the law was written that African, the people that were from the African subcontinent and people from Asia were excluded. Then the law was amended so that people from, from the African subcontinent were able to become naturalized citizens, but for some reason the Asian population was excluded from that amendment. And so indeed, people that were first generation coming from Japan to this country until 1952 could not become citizens. And that fits into George Kahe's story a little bit further down. So that was in December. In February of the next year, Executive Order 9066 was signed by the President. And Executive Order 9066 said that there was going to be an exclusion zone, an area from which people would be moved for the protection of the country. The exclusion zone was basically the west coast of the United States, from Washington down through, through California, predominantly in Southern California and Northern California. That's where there was a large uh, population of Japanese Americans. Now the 9066 did not specify the Japanese community, but that Japanese community was the only ones that were Im impacted by that law, as it turned out. The exclusion zone first included only the coast, and that later on was expanded to be all of the state of California. And so the process was one in which people were given up to two weeks, some people had even less time, to get their affairs in order and they could only take what they could carry. Now, people were leaving their homes, their businesses, they were leaving everything, and they had very, and they knew they had very little chance of ever getting it back, because they were being taken away, and these, their possessions, everything that they owned, was up for grabs, because everybody knew that these are people who had two weeks maximum to get rid of things, and if people decided they weren't gonna buy them, for a fair rate, they were gonna be left behind. And so people felt that, that they could offer pennies on the dollar, if anything, to people. Now you think about, what would you take? If you were told that you were gonna be taken away, you don't know where, and that you could only take what you could carry, would you take things that were of family interest? Would you take your, your most memorable items? Would you take food? Would you take clothes? Would you take towels? What would you take? And then you think about George Takei's family. There's a husband and wife with three kids. The oldest one is about four. The next one's a toddler. The next one's a baby. So you get to carry the, the, by the baby. Maybe you have to carry that toddler and what you can carry for the family of five. This was a very, very tough situation. Also for people that had elderly relatives. The elderly relatives could barely carry themselves. They were walking with canes. They can't carry anything. Their relatives would have to carry things for them as well. There were some people that were, all what was called Terminal Island. Terminal Island is an island out, out by Los Angeles. 
and those people were predominantly fishermen. The people from Terminal Island had it probably the hardest of all because they were extremely suspect because they had boats and they had shortwave radio. And so people were concerned that if Japan were to invade, these people are Japanese, they're out in the ocean, they've got shortwave radios. The people from Terminal Island were only given 48 hours to clean up their, their possessions and, and become evacuated. So those people really had it very difficult. And those people often lost fishing boats, I mean very expensive fishing boats, as well as their homes, as well as their possessions. So when people were evacuated, they needed to get people consolidated and under guard. And this was all done very quickly. The first place they took people were to put they call, what they called assembly centers. The assembly center for most of the people from the Los Angeles area was the Santa Anita racetrack. And this is a racetrack like any racetracks. What it has is stalls for the horses, which were occupied by the horses immediately before they were used to occupy people. So each family was given a horse stall, which was just recently evacuated by the horse, who also did other evacuation things in the horse. Yes, yeah. and so the stalls were cleaned, but if I've been around horses, they still smell like horse. And people were, the whole family was moved into the horse stalls to live until they were able to construct camps to incarcerate people. The picture on the left is actually from Santa Anita. That's one of the food lines. You take a look at that, there's this little tiny kid there. That's his plate. He's about three, maybe. He has to manage that because if you look at it, there's one woman there with four little kids, three little kids maybe, and she can only manage hers, much less try to carry the place for the other kids. So this is a very difficult time for people. As soon as they built more permanent facilities, and that word permanent is a really, really a misnomer, people were moved out of, the, uh, out of those centers to a more permanent location. Now, George Takei and his family had some of the longest moves there were. There were 10 relocation centers built for World War II. Uh, there, uh, on the map in the upper left, the ones that the Takeis were sent to were in Arkansas. And so they had a, roughly a three-day ride on a train to get there. Now, this is a ride in a train. Every time they came to a city, they had to pull down all the blinds because the government didn't want anybody to know who was in that train. Every train car had two armed guards in it. And when they stopped, they did do stops for people to stretch their legs. This is a long ride. Literally, people on the train were expecting that they were going to be taken out and killed because they were in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knew they were there. Nobody, none of their friends knew what had happened to them. And people were very concerned, terrified, that they were going to be taken out of the train and killed. The interesting part about this part of George Takei's novel is that he was a child and his parents hid the realities of what was happening and their fears from him. He thought this was a vacation. His mom packed little treats for them. They told them they were going to go over to a new place. He didn't know. And his parents uh, need to be given a lot of credit for trying to buffer their children from what was happening. They did get to Rauer. Rauer and Jerome were the two camps that were the furthest east, and they were in Arkansas. Now this is a, upper left is a picture from George Takei's book about Rauer. The picture on the lower right is an actual picture of Rauer during the time that people were, incar were incarcerated there. The two colored pictures are from, are from Manzanar. And again, Manzanar is the relocation center that is in Southern California, several hours outside of Los Angeles. The barracks there is a reconstructed barracks. The guard tower is a reconstructed guard tower. The barracks were constructed using a model that was intended for battle-hardened troops in a war zone for temporary housing. And it was never intended for permanent housing for anybody of any sort, much less permanent housing for children and adults and civilians. The way they were built was very expedient. The, again, the model was a model for temporary housing. 
The barracks were arranged in groups of 14 on what was called a block. Every barrack was 20 feet wide by 100 feet long. And that 100 feet, feet of length was divided into four apartments. So an apartment was a room that was 20 feet by 25 feet. They could accommodate up to eight people in that room. And if you did not have eight people in your family, they would put people together haphazardly. Whoever was the next person in line got to live with that family. So you might have two or three different family units living in 20 by 25 feet of space with no other dividers. The barracks were built under a model that was like in the lower right hand corner. The gaps in the wood were gaps in the wood. They were covered on the outside with tar paper, which was held in place by boards. And you can see the outside uh, barracks, you'll see the boards, which was holding the tar paper in place. The one on the right had its roof boards removed because it's inside and they wanted to get the light into there so you could see a little bit more. But you're living in a place that's made out of boards that have gaps between them. There's gaps in the floorboards, as is in the, as in the picture on the left. And they're in places that got over 100 degrees in the summer, and they got below, below freezing in the winter. So you roasted in the summer and you froze in the winter. Each 20 by 25 foot space had one bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling, and they had one stove. And so the up, upper, uh, the top picture is a picture of one of the, the stoves in the reconstructions at Manzanar today. And as the, the tour guides in Manzanar point out, the reconstructions are built a lot better than the originals because the, re the originals would never have passed building inspection. So um, the other thing that's interesting to note at first is that you see how the roof is peaked. The dividers between the apartments only went up to where the roof was. So it was sort of like living in a big cubicle. So everything that was said or heard or done from cubicle to cubicle could be heard throughout the building. And also if you had kids that were really rambunctious and athletic, they could easily go up to the top and peek into the next cubicle, no problem at all. So privacy was not something that was there. Each block had the 14 barracks. They had one mess hall, and we'll see a picture of that in a minute. They had a men's latrine and a women's latrine. The latrines were a building with half showers, half toilets. There were no dividers in the showers. There were no dividers in the toilets. So we had people sitting about as close as we're sitting right here on, on the toilets doing their business with a population that was really very private by their natural tendencies. The mess hall was, a, it was the same model as the barracks, but twice as wide. And the food was what they could do. The cooks for each of the barracks were people that were nominated to be cooks. Most of them never cooked before in their lives. They did the best they could. And so the food was often inedible. And you had problems because you had people that were first generation Japanese who were used to eating Japanese food. And you had people that were second generation and few third generation who were more accustomed to American food. So no matter what they cooked, somebody was probably unhappy, even if, it, even if it was cooked well, which usually wasn't the case. Now think about this. People came with only what they could carry. They were put into a room that was 20 by 25. They got a metal cot, they got a bag, and they were, were directed to a pile of straw. And what they, were, they, what they did is they were able to stuff a bag with straw to make a mattress. So they had a bag with straw for a mattress and a metal army cot, one light bulb overhead, and a stove in the corner. That's all they had. No chairs, no tables, no benches, no shelves. But what the people were able to do is to scrounge for scrap. And when you're building that many barracks, there's, there's scrap wood. So people would scrounge for scrap and build tables, chairs, shelves, benches, etc., from what they could scrounge as scrap. On the picture on the lower left, that is actually Rauer. And those are little kids standing there as they, unlo uh, as they unload the scrap. One of the things that's difficult is there were extreme differences between the people. You had people that were fishermen and farmers and urban dwellers. You had people that were lawyers and doctors. You had people that were very wealthy. You had people that were literally people on the streets sleeping in, in the gutters. You had everybody there together. 
and they tried to keep things as normal as possible for the children. So the lower left picture is a picture from Rauer where they had, it looks, looks like about a kindergarten class for the little kids. But you have the elderly, you have the young. The only com common denominator is that they were all Japanese. One of the things that happened is that you have people that are very angry. There are people that felt that this was totally inappropriate. They were very angry, they were furious. You had other people that said, no, this is my country. I'm gonna support it no matter what. I'm gonna do everything I can to be supportive. And then you had people that were in the middle. And then the people in the middle said, you know, here's where we are, we're gonna to try to make the best of it. And Mr. Take, George's dad, was somebody that was in the middle. He was somebody that was gonna say, we're gonna to try to make the best of it. He was elected block captain. There was one person from each block who was appointed or elected by the group to represent them to the authorities and the administration. So Mr. Take was trying to do what he felt was the right thing for not only his family, but for the other people that were there. And things went along okay at first. In spite of all the hardships, people were scrambling so hard to survive that that was consuming their energy and consuming their attention. Then as things started to settle down, the differences between people's opinions and people's perspectives started to come to the surface. And you had some people that were very angry, very militant, very quite frankly disruptive, who were there saying, we need to fight, we need to protest, we need to be as disruptive as we can. And then of course you had the people that were mod more moderate. And one of the things that happened at the, in December was of 1942 in Manzanar, which was the camp my parents were in, they had a, what they called the Manzanar Riot. And it was a big uprising for a number of complex causes. But basically 4,000 people went and stormed the administrative, administrative building. And there were other uprisings, there were other discontent expressions that were happening at the various camps and the authorities felt that they needed to do something, that they needed to try to, to segregate the people who were going to be disruptive, who were going to be highly dissatisfied from the more, in their minds, understanding part of the community. So the government started a loyalty questionnaire. And the presumption was that if you're going to be angry and disruptive and a dissident, that you're going to tell them, I'm angry, disruptive, and a dissident. That if, you're, if you're a dissident, you're not going to lie and say, oh yeah, I'm really happy here, so you can stay and be a dissident. They assumed that if you're going to be disruptive, you're going to tell them. That was not necessarily true. The other part of it, though, was that, as one of my professors used to say in school, they asked bad questions. And the questions that really caused a lot of difficulty for a lot of people, including George Takei's family, were numbers 27 and 28. And 27 asked you if you were willing to serve in a combat position in the military for the United States. The problem with this question, it was asked to everybody who was over 16 years old. So. At the time, we did not have women, for example, in combat <coughs> positions in the United States. But they were being asked if they would serve in a combat position. It was being asked of people that were in their 80s and 90s. Would you serve in a combat position? It was being asked also of people who were technically in the right age range and the right gender, like George Takei's father. Would you serve in a combat position in the military? And in some cases, as with George Takei's fam father, he was very loyal but realized that if he were drafted and served, he would be leaving behind his wife and three little kids without anybody else to help them survive day to day. So that was one of the problems with the first question. The second question was, would you forswear allegiance to the emperor of Japan? So if you were a first generation person, like George Takei's father, you were prohibited by law to become a naturalized U.S. citizen. <clears throat> you were a citizen of Japan, because that's where you were born. If you forswore allegiance to the emperor, you were giving up your Japanese citizenship. You would have no country. If you were like Mrs. Takei, who was a, a Nisei, a second generation Japanese American person, she, would, she did answer no, because 
in her mind, I'm not going to forswear allegiance to the emperor because I never was I'll, had allegiance. I never had allegiance to the emperor, so I'm not going to forswear it. I never had it. In the midst of all of this questioning and asking about loyalty and asking about the willingness to serve, the 40 and 42nd Regiment was developed. And this was a, a segregated reg regiment, Japanese American Nisei. Most of them came from Hawaii. And the reason is because, even though Hawaii was not a state yet, but it was a protectorate, but Hawaii did not incarcerate the Japanese there. And the reason that they didn't is basically they couldn't afford to. The Japanese population was very large in Hawaii, it still is, and the, the parameters for deciding who was going to be incarcerated were that if you were 1 16th Japanese or more, that you were qualified to be uh, incarcerated. And so pretty much large portions of Hawaii fell into that. And therefore, Hawaii did not incarcerate because they couldn't afford to. So the 42nd was made of predominantly of people from Hawaii who were very eager to serve and welcomed the opportunity and some people from the, the internment camps who very much wanted to prove their loyalty. And so the 442nd was noted for having one of the highest casualty rates during the war. They lost large portions of their, of their manpower during the war. And they were also very much noted for having the, one of the highest levels of, of uh, merit awards for service awards. They were awarded a whole, a whole display case full of what were at that time Medal of Honors, which were later upgraded after the war to Purple Hearts. And the understanding was that during the war they were not going to award the highest, un, highest honor to the Japanese community, even if they did very much earn it by their valor. One of the things they did is that they were, that they were noted for rescuing what was called the Lost, the Lost Squadron. It was a group of, of troops from Texas that were pinned down by the enemy, and they had made repeated attempts to, to, to free them. And finally, the Japanese-American troops went through, suffered huge, huge uh, casualties, but saved the people that were remaining. So, the Takes answered the questionnaire from two slides ago. No, no. No, we're not going to serve in the military for the reasons that I, that I indicated. And no, we're not going to forswear allegiance to the emperor for the reasons I indicated. The problem was that people that were dissident also answered no, no to those two questions. And the government's position was that anybody that answered no, no to those two questions was somebody that was a dissident. And it was somebody that, re that required much more uh, restrictive quarters or, or accommodations for the duration of the war. So what happened was that the people that answered no, no, both the dissidents who were truly angry and people like the Takes were segregated at one of the 10 camps at Tule Lake, which is in Northern California. And so the, the Takes got another train trip, it was like four days back up to Tule Lake, to a camp that was much more militaristic. They had tanks outside the, the camp in, in case it needed to put down a rebellion of basically unarmed people. They had, as he said, I think three layers of barbed wire, not just one. And they had the combat ready troops that were guarding this camp. It was high security, and about, about half of the prisoners were children. So you've got the high dissidents there with all these little kids all together. And one of the difficulties was that in the eyes of the government, everybody there was a dissident. And so the people that were there trying to, that answered out of conscience, no, no, were there with the people that really were angry. And, and sometimes people there that were in the positions of authority got a little confused, and people that were not being dissident were treated as though they were. So it was a very, very difficult place for anybody but especially for those that were not violently dissident. The other problem for people that were like the Takes family 
is that the people that were very uh, dissatisfied, they wanted everybody to be dissatisfied. So they were very hostile to the people who were trying to be cooperative. So it was a very difficult situation. In the midst of all this, the United States government gave the Japanese Americans that were citizens, which are predominantly the Nisei, the second generation, the opportunity to renounce their citizenship. And the reason that the government did this is that they felt that maybe there are people there that are US citizens and don't want to be. But the other part of that was their expectation was if they had people that wanted to be repatriated to Japan, then they could exchange them for people that were US citizens and not Japanese that were being held in Japan so that they were hoping for an exchange of civilians. And very few people took up their offer. But then, this is sort of like all of the holes in the Swiss cheese lined up, and it made life very difficult for the Takei family. Then what happened is in December of 1944, the Supreme Court made a ruling that said, indeed, the Japanese Americans were not being held appropriately against their will off of the West Coast. That, that that was inappropriate and the Japanese Americans could go back to the West Coast, which you think would make people happy. But you've got to remember the war is still on, nobody knows who's going to win, and quite frankly the people in the camps felt that if they went back, they had a very high probability of getting, uh, getting killed, that the civilian population was not going to accept them, and that they were going to probably be killed. So they were terrified to leave the camp while the war was still on. And then the question about are you going to renounce your citizenship took a, a 180 degree turn. Because people like Mrs. Take, who was a Nisei, a US citizen by birth, thought if enough of us say we're going to renounce our citizenship and we become enemy aliens, then they're gonna to have to keep the camps open to keep us in the camps. And so then we won't have to be sent out into the community where we can get killed. And so that was the logic that they had. And so Mrs. Take and a number of others, probably close to 900 other people in, in Tule Lake even, uh, decided they were gonna renounce their citizenship because they figured if enough of us do it, they can't, they can't export all of us. But, and therefore they're going to have to keep the camps open so we and our families can stay safe. But then the holes of the Swiss cheese lined up again. And uh, uh, in August, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed. And that was the end of the war with Japan. <laughs> Japan surrendered and the war was over. And the citizens that were in, in the first generation that were in the camps could leave, except the people renounced their citizenship. They were now, and they were still enemy aliens. So they couldn't leave. And the concern was that, is that, that people were gonna be, ex going to be deported. There was a lawyer who was Wayne Collins, who was obviously not Japanese, or maybe not obviously, but Wayne Collins was not Japanese, who took up the cause of the people who had renounced their citizenship. And he maintained in their behalf that during times of war and time of duress, because these people were being held against their will, that during times of duress, you cannot give up your citizenship, that it was something that was unfairly presented to them. So he filed uh, uh, lawsuits, uh, uh, law appeals uh, against habeas corpus. And with days to spare, he won the case for them. Which meant that the people that were going to be deported because they had given up their citizenship were in, in line for a long time to, before they regained it, but they weren't going to be put on the next ship bound for Japan. And in the case of George Sakei's mother, it was a matter of a day or two. It was a matter of days that she would have been put on the ship before the, the case was resolved in her favor. And about 90% of the people who renounced their citizenship were able to regain it. So the war is over. The Takei Society, and they're going to return to, to California. My parents did not. My parents, that's why I'm here. My parents decided when they left Manzanar camp, my dad decided that he was going to try his luck in the Chicago area. 
And so my, my parents came to Chicago. George Takei's parents went back to Los Angeles. Their first home was on Skid Row. And Skid Row then is Skid Row now. It was a place where we had people that were living on the streets with no sanitation, with not much of anything. But the, again, these are people that had only what they could carry. Their next uh, stop was in pretty much a, a slum building. It was a building that was one step up from Skid Row. You weren't on the streets, but you didn't have exactly what you and I would call good accommodations. Finally, they were able to move up in the world and move and found a homey, a homey, housing in a barrio, which was a Mexican American community, and it was something that was livable. It was back to the standards of what we would consider to be life. <coughs> Nevertheless, not a surprise, George Takei and others faced discrimination. And as a child, he couldn't understand why his teacher was so angry at him, why his teacher was ignoring him, why his teacher was making life hard for him. His adult self, thinking back on that, said, you know, she might have lost somebody. She might have lost a son or a, a brother or a husband in the war to somebody that looks like me. So his adult self came to an understanding regarding the way he was treated as a child. But as a child, he couldn't understand that. So George Takei grew up, went to UCLA as an actor, and he became involved in, in, in social consciousness things. There was a, a, program, a play called Fly Blackbird, which was very instrumental in his life. It was a, a play that was about discrimination. It was about social justice. He and others had a good long run with a play. And through that, he was able to meet Dr. Martin Luther King. And George Hickey actually did participate in some of the activities having to do with Dr. King's ministry toward, toward equality and toward racial justice. And so George Takei had this wonderful career. We, some of us knew him, of course, first and foremost as Lieutenant Sulu. But thanks to a really good franchise and really inventive plots and, the, and, and Star Trek's number one, two, three, four, five. During the course of the multiple Star Treks, George Takei and, and Lieutenant Sulu kept on getting promoted. And by the end of the series, dear, dear Lieutenant Sulu made it all the way up to commander and captain of the USS Excelsior. And so pretty much uh, Lieutenant Sulu did pretty good for himself too. But George Takei used and is still using his position and his visibility to advocate for social causes. George Takei pointed out in his book, this is toward the end of his book, of course, that in 1944, the left-hand side of that picture, there was a, a, a case before the Supreme Court called Korematsu versus the United States, in which one of, uh, Fred Korematsu, had a, a test case before the Supreme Court. And the question was, was he being inappropriately housed? Was he being inappropriately incarcerated? And at that time, the court ruled that that was an appropriate thing. The dissenting opinion at the time was written by one of the Supreme Court justices who said that his only crime was, he was, it was Nisei, he was second generation, his only crime was being a United States citizen living in his home. That was it. His home happened to be in the exclusion zone, and because of that, he was incarcerated. And so that was a dissenting opinion. But the Korematsu case stayed on the books until 2018. And it was overturned by the Supreme Court, it was overturned by the Supreme Court in 2018, which was a great victory for the concept of being uh, that the government cannot just imprison you because of something that, that you, there was no proof you did anything. The part that was really quite ironic is that overturning of the Korematsu ruling was part of a bill that was there that said that people from Muslim countries could be selectively de denied access to the United States. And so that was sort of like the two-edged sword 
same bill with those two things. One thing overturning the, the things from World War II, the other thing affirming that yes, the government could discriminate on the basis of somebody coming from a, co a country that was deemed to be a Muslim country. So, George Takei's book ends with uh, reflections on justice and liberty. It ends with him going back to Rower, Arkansas, in the little picture, with his husband, uh, who is Brad, and going to the, to the uh, Relocation Center Cemetery. Now the picture is one that I got off the web with, a with attribution uh, of one of the monuments. It's at, it is at Rower. And so that's a picture of part of the cemetery at Rower that George Takei goes back to at the end of his book. And the, the, the text here, which might be a little bit hard to read, is that history can't be a sword to justify injustice or a shield, to against, a, a shield against progress, but must be a manual for how to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. And this phrase, never again, is one that has been used a lot recently. For, by a number of different people. It's a phrase, though, that the Japanese American community has held to for decades. It is something that the Japanese American community has always said never again because of what this did. It, the incarceration of the Japanese Americans had huge impacts. People lost all their material possessions. People lost time that they would have been in their most productive years. People lost careers. People, people lost families. I mean, you, that's the, the color picture is the cemetery at Manzanar. There are people that went into the camps, of course, that died and never got to come out. Some of them were elderly. Some of them were people from the various camps that were killed, that they were shot by the guards and killed. There were two people that were killed at Manzanar. There were people that were killed in other places, sometimes, quote unquote, for cause. There were two people that were killed because they were, they were allegedly at one of the camps uh, charging the guards and they were unable to walk. And so there were some questionable things there. There were people that, that died in the camps for reasons that might or might not have been tied to the fact that they were, that they were incarcerated there. Uh, one of the, the families, one of the people that died in Manzanar at the beginning of the war was a woman. She was she was pregnant with twin girls, and it was the beginning of the war. She came down to deliver. They didn't have very much of a hospital. She and her two twin daughters died. And that may, would she have died in a, in a place with a better hospital? Maybe, but you don't know. And so there's things like that that are part of, of what happened and uh, that all get wound up in a very complex story. The book is one that is very interesting. There's lots of other things that are written about it now. I started doing research maybe 15 years ago. There's huge amounts available online now that weren't available back then. And there's books that have been written about it, about the incarcerations as well. I've got some of them on the table, as I've told some of you. The books on the table, some of them are overdue at the library. Sorry about that. Um, but. But there's one here that was written by, well, that features photography by Ansel Adams. Now, Ansel Adams, of course, is a nature photographer, very well known for his pictures of the, the national parks. He was a friend of the person in charge of the camp at Manzanar and came in and did pictures documenting life there. Now, in the pictures, people are usually smiling. In fact, they're all smiling because the people there didn't want the, pe the public to think that they weren't happy. So were they as happy as they look? Probably not. But they were determined to put on the best possible face. The other pictures that are there, it's a book there by Dorothea Lange. And Dorothea Lange was hired by the US government, again, to document the internment experience. So those are all both very widely distributed pictures of the, of the incarceration. There are other books there. The, the iconic one is one called Farewell to Manzanar, published initially in the 1970s, which is one woman's rec uh, recollections of her experiences in the camps. And again, everybody's experiences are very much colored by how old they were, who they were with, what their philosophies were. My parents were at Manzanar. My dad was somebody that, like Mr. Takei, 
wanted to make the best of things. And so he was actually the athletic director for about 10,000 people in Manzanar. So he had a very different experience than George Sakay's family had after they were relocated to Rower, excuse me, relocated to Tule Lake. My uncle, on the other hand, was somebody that was probably a little bit angry around the edges, and he was at Tule Lake, the same way that George Sakay's family was. And so every, every family had their own experiences based on a number of factors, but they're all part of a very, very complex part of our history. The things um, could have been different and could have been better, maybe could have been worse. But thank you very much. I uh, Please take a time to take a look at the books and check them out of the library. Thank you. And George is in the back. <laughs> The Adams books, are, are any pictures of your family in that book? In which book? Yeah, the Adams No, not, re not, not really. My, my parents' pictures are not there. However, because of my dad's position, Manzanar is the camp that is probably the best documented because it was one that, again, that Ansel Adams and Dorothy Lane took pictures of, that sentence, that Ansel Adams and Dorothy Lane had pictures, and that was one that was very well researched. And now, every edition of their camp newspaper is available digitized online. So while I don't have pictures of my parents there, I do have about a dozen or, or 20 different newspaper clips of what my dad did, including things like, for example, um, toward the, the end of the 1940s, he was the athletic director, he was the, the player coach on the Manza Knights baseball team. He was a catcher. And I looked at one of the box scores from toward the end of the war, and he, had, he was playing first base. I'm thinking, he's not a first baseman. Then I read the article, and it said, well, so-and-so that we just, just left the camp to find a job in the, um, you know, in the eastern part of the United States, and therefore my dad was playing first base because he lost his first baseman because he left the camp. Mm -hmm. So things like that are very interesting little side notes, but I don't have any pictures of them there, unfortunately. Other questions? Yes. Uh, what year did the United States government issue the reparations? Did your family receive part of that stuff? Mm -hmm. I don't remember the year exactly. Do you remember, Nathan? 88. 88, 88 or, 87. 87, 88. Yeah. And yes, my family did. They filed for the reparations. My parents <coughs> took their reparation money and they donated it back to Japanese American Service Committee. The JASC is an organization in Chicago that was called, a, they were the resettlers. That was an organization that was, was started in Chicago at the end of World War II to help the people coming out of the camps find, find a place to live and a job. And they were, they still exist on North Clark Street in Chicago. But the JASC is a, still a Japanese American organization. My parents donated their reparation money there because of what the JASC tried to do to help people. Absolutely. Yes, behind you. Ellen. Yes. Did Politically, did anyone in the government at that time advocate for these people? Did they visit the camps? Did, did, did anybody support them in any way? You know, there were certain groups uh, that were supportive. Quite honestly, from what I've read, the person that was in charge of Manzanar was a man by the name of Ralph Merritt. My impression, and I might be wrong, but my impression is that he did whatever he could to make life tolerable for the people there. So in a way, I really think that he was uh, an advocate to the extent he could be. The, there are certain groups that were religious groups that were supportive and would send people. Uh, as far as politicians, politicians, by and large, in the George Chakay's book, he, he's a little bit edgy on the politicians because it was highly politically um, suicidal to say you supported the Japanese. So the politicians were people that were not going to be as readily supportive. But there, were, there was one person that's mentioned in George Takei's book who was coming into the various camps bringing library books into them and was, was chased and probably shot at for, for being supportive. But there were individuals that did that. There were certain religious groups that felt that this was wrong. And they sent people into the camps to help uh, bring, bring letters in, bring letters out, bring supplies, etc. So there were people. Yes, in the back. How many were incarcerated? There were, uh, in Manzanar, there were 10,000. 
Uh, in Mensa, there's probably, what, 100,000 total? Uh, 100, uh, about 120,000. About 120,000 were incarcerated in the, in the 10 camps. Mm -hmm. Truly Lake was the most crowded. At its peak, it had 18,000 people. And so, so that there's a, a large number of people. Good question. Other questions? Yes. Did your family have a tie in Chicago, and what happened to them when they came here? The, the question was, did my family have a tie in Chicago? What happened to them? They had no ties in Chicago. My dad left the Manzanar, and he came, this is family lore, he came out to Chicago to see if he could make a living. And that was before Pearl Harbor. And this is what that That was before Hiroshima. And so it was before Hiroshima. He came out to see if the environment was, was going to be tolerable. He came out, found a job, and my parents weren't married yet. He wrote back to my mom at Manzanar and said, life is tolerable. If you come out here, I will, be, I will watch out for you. So he came out, found a job, said life was tolerable, sent for my mom. She told other people that they hung around with in camp that, she, that my dad had called, had written over and said, life is tolerable. They said, good, we're leaving for Chicago tomorrow morning. She said, I'll be there. And so they said, no, you won't. She said, yes, I will. So it's in, early in the morning, there she is waiting for the bus to go back to, to the train station to go to Chicago. So that my mom came out that way, but my dad came out and many people left before the end of the war. If they were coming east and they could find a job, they were allowed to stay out. If they couldn't find a job or they, they were threatened, they were uh, permitted to go back. Good question, though. Yeah, any other questions? If not, thank you very much for your attention, and we are almost exactly on time. Thank you.